My name is Edgar Black. I grew up born in Del High, Texas in 1925. My dad was postmaster there and had a little grocery store. And we lived there until 1932, and that was right in the middle of the, the Depression, the Bad Depression. No money. It, just, it, was, it was tough times. And my dad migrated to that part of the country because his uh, parents lived in Elk City, Oklahoma, and they had a daughter that moved down into that area, and they came down to, came to Texas or to Delhi in about 1919. And it was one of those January days to where the sun was shining and everything looked beautiful, and they had come out of the sand and snow and sleet of Elk City, Oklahoma. So my grandfather sent a telegram back to Oklahoma to my grandmother said, sell hotel, come to Delhi. And she disliked it to the day she died because she'd been used to running a hotel and seeing people and things like that. But anyway, they, uh, my dad was farming in 1932 and that was a tough, tough time because I remember federal marshals coming to our place and uh, my dad says, I don't want to do it, but I can't, I, I can't sell our cattle or anything. And so they had some kind of a federal program where they just came in and bought your cattle and shot them, drug them out into the pasture and let them rot. I don't know whether this is but that's kind of the background that I grew up in. And one day there was a rich or a fairly wealthy rancher, farmer and rancher in, that, in, in the Delhi area that came to my dad. This fellow by the name of Joe Rockwell. And he says, Edgar, he said, uh, if you and Myrtle will go to Lockhart, he says, I own a, the equipment for a meat market in Lockhart that I'm paying rent on and everything. He says, I got all the cattle in the world, I can't sell them. He says, if you and Myrtle, that was my mother, he said, if you and Myrtle will go to Lockhart and open up that meat market, he said, me and you will be partners. And so that lasted for 50 years or so. And uh, we, we sold Mr. We, we sold some of our own cattle and then also some of Mr. Robles' cattle. And it was tough, tough old times. You could buy a good calf for $10 and things like that. And my dad wasn't a butcher, but uh, he hired a fellow to help him, help him run the meat market and, and do the meat cutting and such as that. And uh, one quick story about about when he was first getting started, he, there was a lady came in, a black lady, and her name was Glennie Childs. And Glennie said, uh, Mr. Black, I want a round steak. And Dad said, uh, Glennie, Bill's not here today, and I don't know how to cut a round steak. And she said, uh, Mr. Black, Get yourself, no, she said, white boy, get yourself behind that meat counter and cut me a round steak. So Dad said, I got back behind the meat counter and cut a round steak, and from then on I was a butcher. <laughs> and so every little meat market, and this leads me into how we got into the barbecue business, but every little meat market in Lockhart then, in those days, had a little pit in the back of the market. And uh, we had a few little tables back there and a few chairs and a little pit. And uh, we cooked, uh, I don't remember now what kind of meat it was. It was show mostly shoulder meat because 
about all people. The, uh, hamburger wasn't a big deal in those days. And so most everybody wanted round steak, T-bones, or loin. And that was about, about the extent of it. And you could buy a biggest round steak for 15 or 20 cents and such as that. And that's the way we got started in the, uh, and then the, the trimmings off of the, the steak and such as that we used to make sausage. And the, uh, the four quarter steak, the uh, shoulder steak, we cooked for barbecue. And that's the way we got, we got started. Very, very, very small operation. And, uh, Were you able to sell everything you cooked? Mostly, I think we could, we did, but we didn't cook very much, so. I think Dad said the first day he was in business he sold six dollars worth of meat, but that was a lot, that was a, six dollars was a lot of a bit of money in those days, from 1932. There just wasn't much going on. And in later years, Dad put in a little line of groceries, and finally we, we, we finally built it up to, uh, we moved across the street in 1937 from where we started and enlarged the grocery business and had a separate room then where we would cook the barbecue and serve, and we had more tables and, and such as that and to where we served the barbecue. And all of this I was in and out just as a kid. And then I eventually I graduated from high school the first the last day of May in 1943. Came home from the party. My dad and stepmother met me. Said, are you ready to go to A&M, son? I said, well, not really. They said, well, we need to get on down there. Because I've already sent $25 to, to your tuition. And so they drove me to A&M and let me out there on that big campus. And I finally found the registrar's office and got signed up for a civil engineering. That's why I wanted to be an engineer and build roads. And uh, I told the guy, the guy I said, what do you want to major in? And though you must remember in those days, all of the, most of the men were off of this, by this time it was, we were right in the middle of the war. And all of the men teachers were off and fighting the war. And we didn't, I didn't have any chemistry. I didn't have any, I had a little algebra and, and such as that. And so I was bogged down when I, when I started out in, in, the, in that engineering class. But I went ahead and passed enough to where I could come back and then I, I joined the Navy when I was, when I was still 17. I joined the Navy in San Antonio. Thought I was going to the West Coast, and I woke up and I said, "Where are? You? Where am I?" They said, "You're in Corpus Christi." And so I got real lucky. I spent the war in Corpus Christi, and then I never. I tried to get shipped out, and commanding officer says, "I says." Taylor, I got you right where we got you right where we want you. And if I decide to ship you out of here, I will personally come and tell you. Now don't you ever bother me again. And so that was the end of my going overseas. So I never got any further than Corpus. And looking back on it, I guess it's the best thing maybe that ever happened to me. I didn't think so at the time, but I was all gung ho and which you could be when you're 17 or 18 years old. So, so after I got out of the Navy, the first day of June in 1946, I waited about three months then before the semester started and I went back to A&M and was through three years, graduated with a degree in uh, accounting. So after I got my degree, my dad says, son, said, won't you come back and help me a month or two? He said, I'm a little under the weather and I need to get back and try to get on my feet. 
So I walked in the front door, and my dad walked out the front door, headed the domino hall. <laughs> so, which was fine with me. And then, but that, that ended my career as of going to, into accounting in Houston. And uh, then dad got into politics and was elected county judge in 19, uh, 1958 served four years and, and was running unopposed for a second term and had a heart attack and died in office and so the whole all of the business then became mine and uh, we Miss Black and I my wife Norma Jean and I took it from there and uh, it wasn't easy but uh, she worked just as hard or harder than I did, and uh, we made a, we finally made a success of it. And uh, when did you get rid of the grocery store? Uh, nineteen. Uh, let's see, nineteen seventy-seven. I think. My wife and oldest son decided it was my health was one of the best in the world, and they decided it was too much for me, and so they they decided to sell it, and that was which suited me fine. And then we concentrated on the restaurant part of it, on the barbecue part, and that, that's that's when we really took off with, with on our on our selling our meats and such as that. And in the meantime, I had uh, I had gone and experimented with different types of meats to cook, and uh, I settled on in the early 50s. There wasn't anybody, well, maybe a half a dozen people in the whole United States that used brisket, and so I decided to go exclusively with brisket. One end of the brisket was lean, one end of it had fat in it, and so it was a perfect meat I thought to, for, for barbecue. And so I experimented with it, and, and, and before then, I had developed the, uh, uh, and, and I say I because I had absolutely had no, no help whatsoever in developing a formula for, for sausage. And so we started, uh, uh, I started out by coming out of a, a&M with a degree in accounting, they didn't teach me much about making sausage. And so I heard an old sausage maker one time, somebody asked him, says, what do you put in your sausage? It makes it so good. He said, it's not what I put in it, it's what I don't put in it. And so when my meat market manager walked in and says, here's some meat I can sell in the, in the, in the uh, grocery store, let's put it in the sausage. That didn't set too well with me. I let it slide that time, but that was the both times, first and last, that we ever put something we couldn't sell at the market into our sausage. So I standardized it and we started, we started making sausage in 100 pound batches. And we used 85 pounds of beef, 15 pounds of pork, and we're still making, we're using that formula. And that was in 1949, so that's probably been nearly 60 years now. And, and we've, we've, we've varied it a, a, half, a, half, a half a pound or so in, in weight at different times, and we always go back to the old standard. And that's how I got to, we started making the sausage. Now in the last two or three years, uh, we had a manager that decided that we needed to have two kinds or two other kinds. And, and they have been very successful too, so.